Hello, everybody. This is a presentation on nuclear uh, terrorism, but because the you know the subject of the course is uh, the peaceful usage of nuclear energy, I'm going to limit the scope of my presentation to uh, try to examine how this peaceful usage could potentially have an impact on the threat of nuclear uh, terrorism. I'm going to try to answer questions such as can terrorists exploit the peaceful usage of nuclear power for their purpose or does the existence for instance of nuclear power generation installation increase the risk of a nuclear attack by a terrorist organization now there is of course no doubt that nuclear terrorism is a real threat um, bin laden for instance at once declared that uh, he uh, he aimed at killing four million americans of which two million children and that's something that you can't really do by flying airplanes into buildings uh, so he, he had other plans uh, the uh, japanese group aum shinrikyo that uh, spread sarin gas in the subway in tokyo many years ago tried over and over again to acquire nuclear weapons uh, or the material to build the nuclear weapons uh, and for instance went as far as buying a farm in australia in australia to mine their own uranium um, there are then many ways that an organization may acquire a nuclear weapon they can buy weapons from a a, a rogue nation for instance uh, north korea or from corrupted the people in pakistan um, they could be buying or stealing military grade material or they could use material from a civilian nuclear power generation installation and try to build their own device from that and that's the that's the, the the, the, the scope of our presentation can they actually do that now a word of caution uh, I am not an expert in this on the subject of nuclear terrorism or on the subject of uh, nuclear energy I, I took a course on nuclear terrorism with uh, Stanford uh, given by a, a gentleman called Bill Perry who was the Secretary of Defense under Bill Clinton it's uh, a rather lengthy course but it's not a very um, advanced course it's high school maybe CEGEP level or something like that um, but I am very interested in the subject of uh, disarmament and nuclear proliferation and I have read a lot over the past year on that subject uh, some of the ideas in that presentation are my own ideas, so please remain critical. It's a presentation for uh, to, to make sure that we have some matters for discussion. My own position on the subject, by the way, is that I am I'm somebody who is pro-nuclear energy, but I'm uh, actually pro-disarmament or against the armament, uh, clearly. Table of content. I'm going to try to teach you how to build a bomb, an atomic bomb in your backyard. Um, and, and then we're going to discuss a little bit how to acquire the material for doing uh, such a thing. Um, how to deliver the bomb that you've built to the right place. And finally, we're going to do a little bit of an analysis of what we have discovered and then and maybe come to a, uh, a tentative conclusion. Now let's talk a bit about how to build a bomb in your basement. Um, we are going to discuss three types of bombs, the fission bomb, the thermonuclear bomb, and the dirty bomb. So the fission bomb, or also known as the uh, atomic bomb, is the type of bomb that was used in uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Essentially, you uh, uh, take a huge nucleus like a uranium-235 nucleus and you bombard it with neutron and it splits into two smaller uh, nucleus and, and releases quite a big amount of energy. The yield of a, a typical fission bomb is between 15 and 30 kilotons of TNT. So the bomb on the Hiroshima, for instance, was 15 kilotons and the bomb on Nagasaki was about 20 kilotons. Although it is possible to manufacture uh, fission bombs with much higher uh, yields, uh, up to about, I think, 300 kilotons. But uh, most of the bombs that have been built with that approach are of yields between 15 and 30 kilotons. 
The thermonuclear bomb is uh, also known as the, the fission bomb or the H bomb. It's a most modern weapons are actually thermonuclear bombs. I mean, those of at least U U the USA, Russia, China, UK, and France. We suspect that the other nations uh, have some, but we don't know. We're not sure whether uh, India, Pakistan, Israel, or North Korea has actually do actually have thermonuclear weapons. Um, it's uh, well, the principle of fusion, where you take two smaller nucleus and you, and you fuse them to form a larger nucleus. Uh, the yields are typically much higher than the fission bombs. They are between 300 and uh, 1200 kilotons. Uh, that is 20 to 80, 100 times more powerful than uh, Hiroshima. Uh, but there were some much larger uh, devices that were built and uh, exploded in, in, in a test. Uh, Russia built a famous Tsar Bomba, which was 3,000 times more powerful and which I believe, if I remember well, sent a shockwave around the earth uh, three times when it exploded. Now, just to give you an idea, this uh, slide shows what would be the effect of a, um, a bomb of about 20 kiloton uh, fission bomb detonating over McGill University. Um, the results would be about 35,000 uh, direct fatalities and about 112,000 uh, injuries, according to this simulation tool called NukeMap, uh, which lets you detonate bombs over any city that you like, including um, Mar -a Largo if you feel so inclined. Um, the orange circle uh, shows the area where people would suffer from third degree burns if they were outside. And you can see that it extends uh, to, for instance, the, uh, uh, the old Montreal port and on one side and the University of Montreal on the other side. Uh, by comparison, this is a uh, 1200 kiloton uh, thermonuclear bomb. Um, and you can see that the uh, region where people suffered third degree bomb extends up to uh, Laval on one side and uh, uh, deep in Toulongueuil and Brassard on the other side. So uh, uh, it would create in that case, maybe about 600,000 fat fatalities and about a million uh, injuries. Now the third type is a dirty bomb, uh, also known as a radiological bomb. I'm going to divide these bombs in two subtypes. Type one would be a, a conventional or non-nuclear explosive used to spread radioactive material. So for instance, you know, dynamite or TNT used to spread uh, radioactive material. They could have some uh, pretty disastrous results. There is a, a publication by the government on, of Canada that was issued in 2002 that says that if exploded in a major urban area, extreme versions of gamma ray emitting bombs, uh, e.g. a nuclear spent fuel and dynamite, could cause more than 2,000 immediate deaths and many thousand more would suffer from radiation poisoning. The type two, I think, would be an attack or, or the destruction of a power plant. Uh, um, this would obviously also spread uh, mat radioactive material, a bit like what happened in uh, Chernobyl, for instance. In the case of uh, Chernobyl, there is actually, you know, a restricted area of about 50 by 50 kilometers, uh, or about five times the area of the Montreal Island around uh, Chernobyl following the, uh, the explosion there. So if we imagine, for instance, that a terrorist group was to attack the station of a uh, Pickering, um, and if we draw a 50 kilometer zone around Pickering, we, we see that you know a lot, uh, a large part of uh, most of Toronto would be affected. But uh, how do you actually build a fission bomb? Well, what you're trying to provoke is a, a chain reaction. So we've all seen the videos with the ping pong balls. The requirements is that you have to have enough mouse traps, and and they have to be close enough. So 
you can imagine, for instance, that if uh, you only have four mouse traps, well, n nothing much will happen. But if you have even a thousand mouse traps, but they are spread over the area of a golf course, nothing much, much will happen either. So there, there's a concept of critical mass, which you need to have enough of the substance and it needs to be concentrated enough. In the case of uranium, for instance, you need to have approximately 50 kilogram of uh, uranium-235 if it is at a concentration of 90%. Uh, you could do with less concentrated uranium, but then you would need a larger mass. Uh, the bomb in Hiroshima used a mass of about 65 kilogram, if I remember well. Um, and um, in the case of plutonium, you, you need a lot less, about 10 kilogram. So if you have that material, how do you make it explode? Well, it's really quite simple. If you have, for instance, uh, two blocks of 25 kilogram uh, of uranium and you just put them together, you get an atomic explosion. Now, of course, I'm simplifying a bit. The technical difficulty is that you have to put these two masses together very, very quickly. What will happen if you bring the two masses together very slowly is that the explosion will begin at the interface between the two masses and it will actually push the uh, rest of the masses away and you won't get the, uh, the size of explosion that you really are you're trying to uh, achieve. So you need to push the two masses together very, very fast. The easiest way to do that is to build uh, what we call a, a gun barrel bomb. That's the, the, the way that the Hiroshima bomb was built. It consists of a conventional explosive, which projects part of the mass over the rest of the mass. In this case, you know, a, a hollow uranium bullet over a cylinder and the resulting mass is more than 50 kilogram and it causes uh, the explosion. So that, that is not a difficult device to build. We estimate that, you know, a team of what, 20 to 30 people, uh, engineers, uh, people uh, operating uh, metal machinery, people and specialized in electronics could uh, build a bomb like that. Now, if you want to build a fission bomb with plutonium instead of uranium, you need to uh, have another approach. The, the gun type or the barrel type of bomb will not work with plutonium uh, because plutonium uh, contains a, an isotope that's uh, very radioactive and will uh, start the reaction too early, a bit like we've seen when we were trying to put the two suitcases too slowly together. Um, so the approach is, is quite different, actually. You need to uh, put a, a sphere, a hollow sphere of uranium, and you start an explosion uh, in a uh, sphere around the uh, plutonium sphere to compress that sphere to a critical mass, and, and then the explosion starts. It is quite difficult to do. Uh, it's quite technical. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But building a thermonuclear bomb is a whole different ballgame, essentially, and I'm not going to uh, uh, discuss that a lot, but you need a, a fission bomb in order to trigger the uh, fusion device. So it is extremely difficult to, to uh, manufacture. Most nations you know, take years between their first atomic bomb and the first thermonuclear bomb. Uh, North Korea took about 10 years between 2006 and 2016. Um, they, they, they claim that they have a new thermonuclear weapon, but it, it might also be a high, a high yield fission bomb. We're not uh, exactly sure. Now, building a dirty bomb. In the case of a type one, you know, conventional explosive spray spreading radioactive material, there's no particular technical difficulty, of course, except the handling of the material itself, which is very lethal. But, you know, if you have handlers that don't care much about staying alive, then maybe it's not a problem. A type two attack of a power plant it is uh, a lot more difficult. Uh, the, the buildings of uh, new uh, 
power plants are typically extremely sturdy. Um, they're built to resist hurricanes, earthquakes, etc. So it's not an easy endeavor. Um, however, we, you know that we know that the typical power plant would not resist impact from a commercial airliner, and and. We know also that stored spent fuel canisters uh, would not resist, for instance, an anti-tank weapon. Uh, some countries have implemented no-fly zone, uh, even the missile defense around the, uh, their installations, but it's uh, uneven from one country to another. And you know, it remains definitely something that, uh, a weakness, something that could happen. So in summary, uh, if we look at uh, building a fission type, uh, gun type bomb using uranium, um, it's relatively easy. Uh, and it is the likely scenario for a terrorist organization if they can get the material. Um, building a fission or implosion bomb uh, using plutonium would be a lot more difficult and, and unlikely as a scenario, I think. A thermonuclear is near impossible to build. Um, Dirty bomb of type one, that is with conventional explosive, is easy to do. Uh, and attacking a power plant is, you know, moderate to difficult. Uh, if you're looking at the uh, airplane scenario, it's probably not easy. Uh, but if you're looking at attacking a power plant with uh, uh, anti-tank uh, weapons, then it's probably not that difficult. Okay, so now that you've, uh, you know how to build your bomb, let's look at what you would have to do to acquire the material that you need. But before we begin, a quick refresher on what goes into uh, power plants and what comes out. The fuel uh, consists mostly of uranium-235. Uh, in its natural form, uranium contains only about 0.7 percent of uranium-35. So it need for most reactors to be enriched to about three to five percent uranium-235. That's not the case for uh, can-do reactors, by the way, because they work with uh, natural uranium. And comes out of the, after the fission process, uh, about three percent of what we call fission products. These are, you know, the smaller nucleus that results from the uranium nucleus being split, and they will over time degrade into other products. So it, it's a complex uh, mixture of uh, very radioactive materials consisting of, you know, uh, molybdenum, technetium, uh, about, I don't know what, 20, 30 different products. Um, and as I was saying, they're very radioactive because they have rather uh, short uh, half-lives. Um, for most light water reactor, the uh, spent fuel will also contain about 1% of uh, plutonium. And that plutonium would consist of about 20% of plutonium-240 and 80% of plutonium-239. And the rest will be uranium, consisting of about mostly of uranium-238, but uh, also some remaining ura uranium-235, about 0.8%. By the way, in the case of the Kandu reactor, most of the plutonium is uh, is consumed, and so there isn't a lot in the uh, spent fuel. So really, if we decided to uh, buy, sorry, to build a gun-type uranium fission bomb, then we would need approximately 50 kilogram of weapons-grade material, as we've said before. That is, you know, a highly enriched uh, uranium-235. Uh, it would be, it represents a sphere of about 17 centimeters, so it's not very big, but it needs to be highly enriched. And we could not use nuclear fuel from a power plant to, uh, to create that material because we would need to enrich it to 90%. As we've said before, typically uh, the fuel contains 3 to 5%, or in the case of can do even 0.7%. So enriching this material to 90% would be extremely difficult. Enrichment facilities around the world are very few and far between, and they're very costly um, installations. 
in fact, you know, the cost of the Manhattan Project was 90% of the cost was in trying to enrich the material that they needed to uh, build the, the bomb. So uh, it, it's uh, highly unlikely that a terrorist organization would be able to uh, perform that without uh, the whole world knowing about it. Um, facilities, by the way, are in just in a few countries, Argentina, Brazil, China, France, Germany, you have the list down there. Now, if we wanted to build a, an implosion type uh, bomb using plutonium, which is technically a lot more difficult, as we've said, but let, let's say that you have a, a lot of technical expertise and you decide to go this way, then you would need approximately 10 kilogram, as we've said, of weapons grade material. Now, in the case of plutonium, the, the problem is the content of plutonium 240. It needs to be less than 5%. And a sphere of 10 kilogram of uh, plutonium would be uh, about the size of a large grapefruit. Now, plutonium is created in nuclear reactors and is found in, and is found in, spent fuel, in spent fuel. It's not found in nature. So the only way you could acquire that would be by stealing or, or buying spent fuel. But light water reactors, have you, as we have seen, produce about, you know, plutonium that contains 80% uh, uh, plutonium 239 and 20% plutonium 240. So it would not be uh, usable. Can do reactors are even worse because they burn most of their uh, plutonium 239 and there's little left. So the, the fuel would not be usable. Uh, if, if, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to do some kind of uh, uh, isotope separation, which is to separate the plutonium 240 and that is extremely difficult also note however that you know reactors can be used to produce less plutonium 240 if you leave the uh, fuel inside the reactors for a shorter time and and that's what what's used by countries that uh, produce uh, plutonium for their uh, nuclear uh, arsenal If you wanted to build a dirty bomb, then your best option would probably to use spent fuel. Uh, it would make excellent material. It, it's 3% uh, of all radioactive waste worldwide by, by, by weight, but it's about 95% of all radioactivity. So it's very radioactive, very lethal. The easiest way to get it would probably be to attack a convoy during transport. But then again, I suppose that uh, if you did that in the United States or Canada, uh, there would be a bit of follow up on the event and you would have to be pretty good at hiding yourself very quickly. Admitting then that you have succeeded in uh, acquiring the material and building the bomb that you wanted to build, uh, how will you deliver it to the uh, target site? Well, I'm inviting you to have a look at a short extract from an excellent movie called Countdown to Zero. So here it goes. We've spent billions of dollars putting in radiation detectors, but highly enriched uranium is easily shielded. If you are depending on portal monitors to defend a city against a nuclear detonation, you have done far too much too late. The, it, it, nuclear weapons don't have to be exactly on target. Close is good enough. If a terrorist thinks that the portal monitor might detect the weapon, they set it off in the port. Honey rich uranium is easy to smuggle. The radiation is very weak. Detectors that we're putting in place now would have no chance of detecting highly enriched uranium in a cargo container. The signature from highly enriched uranium is so slight that they have to set the monitors very high to detect it, and so they're getting thousands of false alarms every day. Toilets will set it off. China, porcelain. Ceramics, stone, like granites, a lot of bio biological materials like tobacco, some uh, algae. 
televisions, the old style televisions, um, kitty litter, a lot of chemical products and a lot of other stuff also. You want to smuggle a bomb into the United States? Ship it in a truck with kitty litter. No one would ever find it. So a bomb made with uranium-235 or, or even plutonium-239 would be uh, easy to conceal and very difficult to detect. However, you know, fission products, which are much more red radioactive, such as spent fuel, um, would be detected in, in uh, a container. So what can we conclude from all of this? Well, as we have seen, the construction of a fission gun type bomb uh, using uranium would be relatively easy and it would be the likely uh, approach that a terrorist group would use. But the fuel acquisition would be very difficult in the context of a peaceful usage of nuclear energy. Using the fuel from a power plant or the spent fuel would not work. It would be, you would need to enrich it and it would be extremely difficult to do. But if you are successful somehow, then it would be relatively easy to conceal it and deliver it through international borders. In the case of an implosion bomb using uranium, well, the construction would be difficult and it would be unlikely that a terrorist organization would be able to achieve that. The fuel acquisition would be as difficult, and but the delivery would be as easy. In the case of a thermonuclear, we're saying that it's technically near impossible. A dirty bomb of type one would be easy to build. Uh, the fuel acquisition might be possible again by attacking a convoy, um, but the uh, delivery, uh, if you wanted to uh, send such a bomb through international borders would be very difficult. Uh, however, if, if you built the, the bomb inside the country and, and did not have to cross borders, then you could probably you know, deliver it relatively easily. Um, a dirty bomb of type two where you attack a uh, power plant where would be from moderate to difficult. Um, and in that case, there's no uh, fuel acquisition or delivery uh, issue. But I'd like to come back on the subject of the fuel acquisition for a uranium bomb. There are a couple of factors which may impact the difficulty of uh, acquiring this material. Um, things may change if new technologies emerge to uh, enrich uranium. Uh, there is a process in uh, Australia called Silex, if I remember well which is being kept secret, but it's supposed to be, you know, 10 times an order of magnitude uh, uh, easier to uh, more performant than the traditional approach for uh, uranium enrichment. Now, it doesn't mean that it, it, it is uh, it makes the thing easy, but, you know, we can expect that, you know, 20, 30, 40 years time, somebody will invent a new process that might make it easier for terrorists. Um, the other thing is that there is still a lot of highly enriched uranium used in peaceful application and spread all over the planet. Um, for instance, we in the 1950s and 60s, research reactors were fueled with uh, highly enriched uranium that was supplied mostly by the United States. And there are there were still about 140 of these uh, reactors in 2006. Uh, they're being gradually, you know, uh, taken offline, but there still there were still 74 in 2016. Um, and 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 by the way, you know, the the fuel these reactors are certainly not protected the way that uh, nuclear power plants are protected. Um, the production of nuclear of medical isotopes, as far as I understand it, for a while was using. Uh, highly enriched ur ur uranium, but this approach is being phased out everywhere around the world. Uh, but the, there are also things like uh, Russian icebreakers. Uh, they, they have currently a fleet of four icebreakers that use uh, highly enriched uranium. And um, I've read somewhere that uh, some ships carry up to 200 kilograms of uranium-235, so you know enough to be to 
to build quite a few bombs if they were to be uh, attacked. The bottom line, I think, is that you know we are entitled to put a couple of question marks after the word difficult under fuel acquisition for uranium. Uh, thing might change because of a future development in ur and uranium enrichment. And there is quite a bit of uh, highly enriched uranium out there. So in conclusion, I think we can safely say that terrorists could profit from the peaceful usage of nuclear energy, but in a very limited way. Their, most of their options would be a conventional uh, dirty bomb with a conventional explosive or the attack of a nuclear power plant, both of which are, are, are not that obvious uh, in a country like Canada, for instance. Um, I, I doubt, again, that you would be able to attack a convoy of spent fuel without attracting a bit of attention. Um, to reduce the risk, we should, we must, uh, however, you know, put a bit more effort on protecting spent fuel, uh, definitely eliminate the civilian use of highly enriched uranium, and monitor research on the uranium enrichment processes. I must remind you, however, that in this presentation, we've looked at, you know, the peaceful usage of uh, nuclear energy. It is a lot more scenarios where terrorists would acquire a material or a device from a rogue country or a rogue organization are much more likely. Thank you.